classes. Oh my god. Okay, um, so how the signing works is um, you make a hash of your um, Java binary, you send it to RIM, the hash, um, you pay $100 by credit card um, to get a account, and then um, you get it signed by RIM. Now the suspicion here is that um, you go ahead and um, they collect all the hashes, so in case someone writes warm for Blackberries, they would actually know who wrote the warm, um, which is an interesting idea considered that there are no stolen credit cards on this planet, and um, there is no way to have an anonymous credit card account. Um, the firmware itself is um, signed as well, so you can't just like modify the firmware, I tried that. Um, the loader checks the signature on the firmware, um, which is easily circumvented by like the shortest IDA manual ever. Um, this is how you, how you get to the code position where the signature is checked. Um, you just search for the word signature and cross references. Um, unfortunately, and luckily for RIM, the device checks that as well. So the signature is checked on the device as well, so it wouldn't boot your modified firmware. Um, quite a while ago, we, like years ago, we did a talk on embedded systems that involved a Siemens mobile phone that died with a specific bug in um, reading JAT files, um, pretty much. Um, we used those files and just checked them out with a BlackBerry. Turns out um, one of them actually caused an exception in a browser that was not caught and left a dialog on the system open, um, which makes your browser freezing. Um, other things that there is still lots of stuff to do on a BlackBerry, especially on a device side. There's JTAG connectors. How many people of you have ever heard of JTAG? Can you raise a hand? Okay, very good. Good educated crowd. Um, so JTAG is a hardware debugging thingy um, in very short, uh, which is quite useful because you can solder stuff to the device and do hardware debugging. Um, Finding the JTAG connectors, Bluetooth, nobody played with Bluetooth on the Blackberries yet. JVM box, I mentioned those. Reversing the images, finding out what's, what's going on, what are the checksums and stuff. Um, or reading and writing memory. For the JTAG, um, at PH Neutral, um, one, of the, one of the German guys from CCC came up with a device called a JTAG Finder. Um, so he's connecting his JTAG finder to like every possible pin on the device and then has an ASIC that runs over all the connections and tries to figure out which is JTAG. So he found JTAG and this is my specially modified BlackBerry that has a second cable and then um, I had a nice person building this other special cable for me um, because if I try to solder something it just smells of integrated circuits. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> But now we actually do have JTAG on a BlackBerry now, and it's like you can actually Google for it. The guy who wrote the JTAG finder and built it um, has a documentation on all the JTAG stuff for the BlackBerry, so you can actually solder them on and get full debug access sub CPU level. Um, mine doesn't work yet fully, but I assume that's just me. Um, so for the, for the protocols, I have to speed up a bit here. Um, the protocols are almost boring once you figure them out. Um, so it's, it's called SRP, the Server Relay Protocol, that's the outer encapsulation, um, where you have an SRP header and then multiple payloads and chunks and a termination thing. Um, those are, I skipped those, they're here for reference. There are two types of chunks, which is integer and strings. Um, there's not much you can do with that. There are a number of operational codes. Um, we didn't play with them yet, so they're here for your reference and for your entertainment. If you don't have anything to do in your company and you have an enterprise server, um, this is the functionality the, the protocol provides. So um, there is still quite a lot of stuff that one can play with, like um, I would say config sounds interesting. Um, this is how the session setup works. So the client actually goes to the server, like the enterprise server goes to RIM and sends a system ID and then he gets a challenge and they do crypto back and forth and then they do init requests and result. The good thing is um, FTR implemented the whole thing as a Perl script. So we can be an enterprise server to RIM with a few lines of Perl now, um, which is quite useful for doing other stuff. 
Um, then you have, like, in the SRP, you have the gateway message envelope, which is actually used for sending messages. And it includes the, the message routing information, pretty much like SMTP, um, where the email includes the routing information, which is sender and recipient and the message ID. Um, here's the format. Let's skip that. And then you have application layer identification. Um, it's going to tell you in clear text if it's like CMIME means it's an email message, um, CCAL is calendar updates, IT admin obviously is IT admin messages. Um, and if you do some of the PIN messages, like device to device PIN messages, um, they're encrypted. And if you do like server to device PIN messages, they don't have to be encrypted. Like if you write software um, on the service side, you have PIN messages that are not encrypted. Also, when you use the Java API, um, I've seen several developers like repeatedly in forums um, tell everyone, do not just use the Java API and send a PIN message because it's gonna be unencrypted. And like it's, the developers, some of them know and repeat it over and over again, but most of them don't. So many of the third party applications actually don't communicate encrypted, although they think they do. Um, the pin messages in clear are pretty useful because now that we have a Perl script talking to RIM, we can send messages. Um, again, format. And then application layer um, payload in, in the whole thing um, looks like this. There's some, some crypto in there. I'm going to skip that. So about the crypto, um, in short, we don't know shit about crypto. Um, so we just skipped that part altogether because it wouldn't make any sense to like look at the scrambled text and, and try to figure stuff out there are other people doing crypto. Um, this is a decoded dump. It's in the slides for reference. The thing is, um, based on that, you can do traffic analysis. So if you own someone's, um, some router in front of um, some company's internet connection, um, which depending on the vendor of the router might be fairly easy. Um, then you can see messages going in and out. And if you see an email message coming in and afterwards a message coming out from a sender pin, which is a server, to a recipient pin that you don't know, and you have a content type that says CMIME, which is obviously an email, um, and you send another email in with the same recipient and it comes another message out with the same recipient pin, then you know that pin the device identification number of this email address. So you can do traffic analysis and you can see um, who's actually receiving this stuff even though it's encrypted. Um, we had some fun with the, with the SRP protocol, although it's so simple. Um, there, is, there is something um, that's called the SRP ID and the SRP key. Um, and the legitimate owner is disconnected or more or less disconnected when you connect with the same ID. So if you have two people connecting, it, it causes a routing problem at RIM's side because they cannot decide who's, who's gonna get the messages. So they essentially disconnect both. Um, that means that like, you get a new connection up. So, um, but the problem is if you do that like more than five or six times, it's gonna lock you out because there's obviously a problem. Um, the other problem is there is no procedure in place to inform the legitimate key owner that he's locked out. Um, so I talked to a consultant setting up um, enterprise servers all the time and he said they had this problem with two test systems um, and they tried to figure out why they couldn't get a connection for a week till they called RIM and said, could you look at the database? And they're like, yes, you're locked out for a week. So that's fairly interesting. If you got someone's SRP authentication key, then um, you can make it um, pretty sure that for the next week there's gonna be no Blackberries. Um, also, the SRP authentication keys is really interesting because they look like a CD key. They go like XXX-XXX stuff. Um, so they're not considered a secret. Um, I've seen presentations, you can actually Google for presentations that tell you how to set up an enterprise server. And I've seen presentations from security professional CISSP who put screenshots 
on the presentation how to do the setup. Now the screen, the dialogue is gonna display that in clear text. It's not like styling it out or graying it out. It is displaying the SRP authentication key in full text. So the screenshots actually con um, contain the most valuable secret that his company and RIM shared and that authenticated his company to RIM and vice versa. So by just Googling, you can take over um, the, the BlackBerry communication of larger companies. Um, and of course, there, is an, and there has been an implementation bug, um, which is an integer overflow um, with the negative value of the string tag. It's going into an infinite loop. Um, quite useful, but I think it's fixed. Um, now the thing is that you can, you have clear text pin messages, and now since we have a Perl script sending stuff, um, we can actually like iterate through all the device IDs and spam everyone, um, and you can actually spoof the sender. So we can send messages to pretty much every um, BlackBerry owner in the world and just, you know, advertise that Finola Disco or something. Um, I think they're in the process of making sure that you can at least turn unencrypted pin messages off, right? Um, so you can turn them off um, to make sure that at least whoever communicates with you does have an enterprise server and not just a cheesy post script. <coughs> the enterprise server. Let's look at the architecture a little bit more in detail. What we have here is um, the enterprise server box in the middle um, here. And then you have a, something that's called the BlackBerry router, which is actually just an SRP talk and TCP relay. Um, it's nothing fancy, it's just there, so this connection out to the internet to RIM um, does have a second hop and makes the security administrator who like, puts so much work into his DMZ um, a little bit more happy, but it doesn't really make any difference in terms of security. Then you have the management software here, and you have a connector to nodes, exchange, or group-wise, and you have a required Microsoft SQL database. This is the, uh, the account privileges. Earlier I mentioned that you should look at what processes need what privileges, and you see here, this is from the, um, from the operation manual, I just make it a bit more readable. Um, you see it's quite powerful, so like the, the service account needs locally lock on, lock on as a service, lock, local administrator, read only um, administration of the entire exchange and read and write administration access to the exchange mail store. So that means if you own this device, you own the entire exchange server. Um, the manual says that you can put all those three accounts into one account from, from the check marks. It's fairly obvious why, because they all need lots of, lots of privileges. The SQL database is interesting. Um, the, it uses user authentication instead of in integrated authentication in case of a Lotus Domino connector. Um, I don't actually know why, but like for exchange, they, um, they support integrated authentication. For Domino, um, there is user authentication, which like, is well known to be not as secure as integrated. Um, there are tables for individual messages. So um, if you have access to the database, then you can read everyone's email. Um, there is a table with the SRP authentication key sitting there in clear text. Um, there's a table with all the device keys, um, which is like the previous one, the current one, the next one. Um, and you can use the device keys to decrypt the traffic, which we did, and it worked. Um, and the default account is SA and doesn't have a password.